he had kicked over this thing of kerosene, and it had somehow spread all over, and it, and it completely burned. Like, every part of him was burned. You're like, this is everywhere. This is happening all the time. And I went from being like the anti-capitalist to, uh, Dad, I'm going to go to business school. <laughs> So I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation I, because Sam and his team at D-Light have kind of trailblazed the way for probably hundreds of entrepreneurs, and I'd say us included, at Unreasonable, kind of showing us what's <coughs> possible a little bit ahead of the time. Um, so before we get into all that, Sam, I, I just want to start, how many countries have you lived in? Lived in? Maybe, I don't know, eight or nine? Eight or nine. And uh, wh where'd you grow up? I grew up in West Africa, Liberia, and Cameroon when I was a bitsy baby. Yeah. And then Pakistan for elementary school, and Peru yeah. for middle school, <laughs> and India for high school, and then Canada for undergrad. Canada! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, that begs the question what was going on? My parents worked for USAID. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I got to have a good life overseas. And yeah, and how do you how do you think that that level of travel or exposure to cultures how, how does that shape who who you are today? <laughs> yeah, really, pretty naturally. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was just just my life. My role models. Everybody was doing interesting work for development. My dad was doing uh, agricultural development and energy, yeah. um, and my mom was doing child and maternal health, and yeah. so like all the dinner table conversations were all about how do you move the needle, Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you went to university in, in Vancouver? In uh, Victoria, in University Victoria. Victoria. Okay. And then, and then I, when, when did you start to get the entrepreneurial itch? Because I know you've worked on a lot of projects before, before D-Light. What, yeah. what was the first one? Uh, I, you know, because I didn't really think of myself as an entrepreneur, but I think yeah. I was driven by environmental issues. Yeah. So like, I'm thinking in high school, uh, there was a slum next to our school, this is in New Delhi, and I was just like, why are we recycling this stuff? And I knew that mm -hmm. in, the, in the slum they would collect all the waste somehow out of the waste stream and then they would sell it on. So I just thought, okay, well we can just sort it in the school as an environmental club, create an environmental club, sort it, and then I'll bring it over there, they'll weigh it by the kilo, and then we can get money to do environmental projects. So, okay. you know, that's how it sort of started from there, I guess. Yeah, it just happened. Yeah, Ten dollars at a time. <laughs> you don't make a lot from bringing paper to the dump. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you start there in high school. You you go to Victoria for university. Well, what were you, what were you studying? Like, what were you planning on becoming? Uh, I just wanted to study anything to do with environment, but there yeah. was no such thing as like an environmental major. Really, that was yeah. sort of a you could get a minor in it maybe. Yeah. So I did biology. Yeah. Because. Um, yeah. Plants are awesome. <laughs> They're really <No> cool. <laughs> and uh, did you did you like get into that as a career? Like after after university, what happened? Uh, university, I met somebody who said, "Do you want to bike across Canada?" Yeah. Um, and let's let's bet the Canadian government that we can do more to reduce climate change than the government can. Yeah. Um, she just like said this to me, and I was like, oh, "Okay, yeah, sure, whatever." And then disappeared. She actually went. She took meth liquid and went crazy, stole somebody's kid in Vietnam, jumped off a building, like went mad, and then came back to Canada, and I went to visit her at the hospital. She's like hearing voices and wow. stuff in her head, and she sort of got better over a month, and then she's like, remember I told you like six, eight months ago, and you said you were gonna ride across Canada? Are you in? <laughs> you said like, yes? The last month before, and I was like, yeah, I'm in. I'm like, let's go. So I just showed up at that very western edge of Canada, and there was a big bus, and we were running it off to use vegetable oil, windmill on top, some solar panels, or whatever. Printing shirts with like they made potatoes so you could print a logo and stamp it, whatever. And then we yeah we biked across Canada and challenged the government. It was cool. How to go? What happened? It was it was amazing. Yeah, we would we'd send two scouts out ahead, and you'd like meet with all the mayors or city councils yeah. or schools or whatever, and and then the rest of the folks would come on their bikes. Yeah. And then we basically had this: if you picked six of any twelve things, you could reduce your carbon footprint by by half, and you'd mm. sign up to what we called the pledge. And yeah. then we went to Ottawa to present it to the prime minister. What did, what did the prime minister say? Ah, uh, we couldn't get in the door. <laughs> so, oh, no, you biked across so, the whole country. So we did a funeral for the future. We oh, created no. a coffin and did all this stuff. And then, uh, it was fun. That's amazing. And, okay, then somehow out of Canada, like what pulled you back overseas? Uh, well, I was applying to Peace Corps. Okay. While I was there. I'm half Canadian, yeah. half American. Yeah. And uh, I was riding one day. <laughs> I, I got the, all the options yeah. in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, Sam. Yeah. I got both passports. 
<laughs> so, no, I was riding across Canada and uh, applying to Peace Corps. Yeah. And uh, they had given me some places, but it wasn't like, exactly what I wanted to do. And then that day, they, they offered me Benin. Hmm. And I was like, oh, Benin? Like, where's that? Where's that? Like, this is embarrassing. <laughs> oh, where's Benin? And the guy next to me was like, Benin, yeah, I spent six months there. Like, I'll go back in a second. And that place is amazing. People are great. And I was like, good enough for Tim? <laughs> good enough for me. I'm in. And signed up and went to Benin. Yeah. And how, how long were you there? Benin, it's uh, between yeah, Togo and Nigeria. Yeah. There's a little like drumstick there. Which is this little thing with like 10 million people and 62 languages. And wow. And like Muslim, Christian. Uh, sorry, Muslim, like animus, girl, everybody's animus. And yeah. so, like, so much diversity in this tiny little place. Huh. Amazing. Huh. And it's where, when you think of Haiti and voodoo and everything, all that came out of the Dahomey Empire and, wow. and that area. It was a really amazing place. Yeah. I later learned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you spent two years there? Three years, four years? I ended up spending four years. Okay. It's normally like 27 months yeah. deal. Yeah. And then, but I had started. Various, then I became quite a bit more entrepreneurial. Yeah, yeah. So you get paid five bucks a day otherwise. <laughs> I had a lot of vacationing I needed to do. So, so, then, so okay, getting a little bit entrepreneurial, I mean, uh, I'm guessing there are, there, are, there are issues in that area in Benin when you were there. Like, did you start solving social problems, environmental problems? Were you just trying to make money? What was going on? Yeah, just trying to make money. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Peace Corps. I wanted to do development with Peace Corps. Yeah. Well, Peace Corps doesn't do development, right? It's a social exchange program, really. Yeah. And so if you want to do development, you got to raise money. And yeah. you can either write the applications for six months and try to get 10000 bucks, or you just do it. So I don't like selling cement. And, like Nobody has cement. They can't even hmm. fix their houses because the supply chain's broken. So yeah. I would go get money somehow, buy like a, an 18-wheeler equivalent <laughs> of cement, bring it to the village, throw it in my room, and then just like sell packets of cement, you know, <laughs> okay, like, really? whatever I can do. It's, I mean, it has a development impact. Yeah, yeah. Like, there was a purpose to it, but I also wanted to make enough money to, to like, sustain it. And then I did that because I wanted to build latrines in the village. Yeah. You need cement to build the latrines. It's too expensive if you buy them one pack at a time, so I need the truck. So, you know, like, so everything became these things. Okay, then I need masons, so I got to train the masons. So, blah, 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 blah. And then eventually found some really uh, awesome local people who wanted to start bigger things yeah. um, and just sort of clubbed up with them and started an NGO and yeah. um, then my favorite project was uh, Moringa. If I don't know if people have heard of Moringa, it's this uh, like miracle tree. Yeah. And basically you like throw a seed and it lands on the ground and out comes a vitamin pill, spinach, like this amazing <laughs> thing that you can't kill, grows like mm -hmm. mad. As long as you just keep cutting it and hacking it, it just grows more and more and more. <laughs> And you can put it in anything, and it doesn't ruin the taste of anything. And you give it to anybody who's sick, and they just produce more blood and get better. Like wow. it was unbelievable, <laughs> like unbelievable thing. And so I was into planting a lot of that, and yep. then trying to train all the health centers and, and hospitals and stuff to give it to people who were either malnourished or were pregnant, and et cetera, et cetera. Can you smoke it too? <laughs> That's an interesting idea. Coming <laughs> from Canada, we could do something with that. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like you. It's <laughs> <laughs> William. Yeah. It's alumni. Yeah. Um, and then, so, so what? Where did D-Light come from? Like, and how many years off are we from D-Light industry now? No, 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 this is, I, I was living in a village. I had no electricity, okay. no running water, no roads, no telephone, no nothing really. Yeah. A um, couple things happen. First, they give you a, every piece of volunteer gets a kerosene lantern, so you sit yep. there. Wow. My house was like pretty get, like you read at night, you put a lantern somewhere, and like, occasionally a bat smacks you in the <laughs> face, or you know, you're doing whatever. I had, some, I had some pretty crappy experiences. One day, I was eating with a friend outside, so when it's really hot, you can't really stay in your house. And I walked in, and a snake bit me like right on the <gasps> threshold of my door, and Jeez. you drop the lantern, of course, when a snake yeah. bites you, and then it smashes. And wow. you're standing in the dark, and what? you don't know what's going on. So and that <laughs> night was a mess because yeah. a lot of the clinic near us didn't have any anti-venom, and they thought it was a green mamba. Oh, jeez. Mm. So, so they were like, you have 45 minutes. And it was cotton season, and at night the cotton trucks are like around the road. You can't even see. It's all stuff. So anyway, a friend wow. went, but we didn't have money for even petrol. Like, we walked everywhere. So they borrowed some gas, put it in the in a guy's motorcycle, and we went to the nearest clinic, seven kilometers away, which we also didn't know. We're like maybe yeah. they'll have something around. And you walk in, and they said, "You're lucky. We have one left, and the guy last week didn't have enough money." Oh. <laughs> so they gave, they gave it to me. I went back, and 
what they gave it to me caused way more problems because it turned out it was like a harmless tree, <laughs> tree snake but my arm had like a massive like welt and anyway so that was one experience that freaked the hell out of me the, the, the major thing was then the, the two other things happened uh, one was I had I eventually got rid of this thing because yeah. they had some piece of volunteer at a Kmart lantern like a little headlamp you buy yeah. them for like five bucks and I bought it off. I wouldn't give it to me. I bought this thing off him, and then it like transformed my life because I had mm. two stupid LEDs on my head, and I could do everything. But I would also go to like these death ceremonies or marriage ceremonies and playing the drums and everything. Normally, they rent a generator, and the generators always conk off at some point. So everybody's dancing stuff, and then the generator stops, and then the whole party dies. Yeah. Hundreds of people. But I would just like take my headlamp and hold it over my head and turn it on. <laughs> it's just like a silly little thing, right? Whole party starts up, like everything's going again. <laughs> so I was like, this, and everybody wanted it, right? Yeah. Like, everybody wants to buy this thing from me. Coolest guy in the village. Of course. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, I'm writing all these, like every lighting company in the world, my letters from the middle of West Africa, and nobody responded. Huh. And I didn't get one email or one letter response from any company in the world wow. to do any business in West Africa. Wow. So like, and then the final thing that really tipped the straw is I, I biked home one day, and my next door neighbor, who was at that time, would have been a 12 year old boy, mm. had, he had like kicked over a, they were like one of the wealthier families in town because he was a teacher, yeah. he had a government job. And he had kicked over this thing of kerosene and it somehow spread all over and it mm. hit a pilot light on this little kerosene fridge and it mm. completely burnt, like every part of him was burnt. He was just lying down on the ground. Jeez. And they take all the local leaves and stuff and they put it all over him. That's how they're gonna deal with the burns. And I saw him and I was watching him sort of get better, but I was doing research and I was like, I, I guess I, I don't know why I hadn't clued in that this was like every village in Africa and a lot of Asia, like this is everywhere, this is happening all the time. Yeah. And so I guess for me it was just, I would sit there at night like this, it's smoking hot, I'm sitting there, I don't have anything to do, I don't want to turn on the kerosene, I'm just sitting there and there's like satellites orbiting the earth. Totally. And in your brain you're just like, this this doesn't work like totally. this is the biggest market failure possible we have to do something about this so then i went from being like the anti-capitalist like <laughs> i hated capitalism right i, I like can't stand ceos yeah. to you are. uh dad i'm gonna go to business school like <laughs> and just started researching every like, yeah. non-grade print startups whatever i could do like where do i go to learn yeah. social entrepreneurship yeah and yeah that's good. so just just so we fast forward today how, how many Households is D light in today. How many lanterns have you sold? Uh, we've probably s we've sold something like fourteen or fourteen to fifteen million yeah. lights. So yeah. we've reached about there's usually like five people per house. Yeah. So yeah, sixty five million something like that. Sixty five million people. One percent. One percent. So yeah, anti capitalists to 65 million people impacted. How long ago was that? Has this been a 10-year journey? Ten, nine ten, years. Yeah. Nine years. Um, man, there's so many pearls of wisdom in your story from that to here. And I know you feel like you're just getting started. <laughs> uh, but what, can, can you share with us the, just the two hardest lessons that you've learned along the way of building D-Light? Uh, it's painful. Um, <laughs> I don't know. And I ask so that lessons. others don't have to live through. Yeah, yeah no, I know. Through. I'm just thinking we just didn't. I think the number one thing for me was I was so mission focused hmm. that I just wasn't. I remember once we had we had a bunch of our employees. We were relatively smaller at that time, and we were having like a disagreement on whether we should prioritize people more or the mission more. Hmm. And I was like. Mission really. In the mission totally. thing, and I remember this like this awesome designer I had, and he was totally in the people side. Yeah. He's a very good friend of mine still, and not like that decision. If I had gone the other way and made it different and actually been totally people focused, I thought I could have saved half our time, and we'd be twice as big now. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, like we did, we we got our first global head of HR, which was still just like a promotion. Yeah. Uh, two months ago. Two months ago. Yeah. Yeah, 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 mistake. And, uh, and that's and a big one. That's two. That's both. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Why, why, why do you think that slowed you down so much? If you un unpack that, going mission first instead of people first. Because we just weren't building. I mean, we did care about who we hired and stuff like that, but it was more about like what's the output people can give, not what's the career within Delight, yeah. not about them. It was about us. 
not about uh, maximizing their potential. It was about reaching the most people. I just like we would have got all the same things if we focus yeah. on them, but it just uh, wasn't there yet. Yeah. Did you burn through people then? Oh, definitely yeah. burn through people and ourselves. Yeah. You kill yourself because you're not a leader. You're trying to manage. Yeah. 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 So now, now, how has that changed for you now that you've realized that? Oh, I'm so jazzed to try to be a leader. <laughs> it's so, oh my gosh, it's so fun to think that you can actually help people do what they, anyway, can, they all want to do it and get yeah. out of their way. Yeah. Oh man, it's like, I'm loving it. Yeah, it's the best. It really is the best. It, what, what, what about, speaking of people, um, you have a co-founder yeah. in, in D-Light, right? Ned. Yeah. Um, and you guys still working together on the company? Oh, I couldn't like. Yeah. I don't want to start another company without a co-founder. Yeah. I have no interest in doing anything yeah. without somebody like Ned. Yeah. Totally. I would never would have worked without him. Totally. So we have we have a kind of interesting. I was talking to to Ty today. Uh, we have a really <laughs> we have an awesome relationship, and actually in the last year or two, it kind of suffered a tiny bit. Yeah. And last right before I came here, you know, I was in Nairobi and Kenya, and I was like, you know, we should get that thing back. Like we should totally. get back to exactly where we were because when there's two of us. And we have, we always had total trust, but we, like, instead of both of us jamming constantly at 2x speed, we got to kind of maybe one and a half speed. And I think now we might be able to go to like three or four x speed if yeah. we both are actually leaders. Yeah. So I, there's something about having whenever I'm down, he can pull me back up. When we're both down, we can talk to each other if you need yeah. to do. Uh, there's just like, it's total magic when you have somebody else. Is, is, there, is there anything you've learned along the way to make that work? Like any, anything that was. Un, unnatural that you wouldn't have normally have done that has led to such a good relationship? I don't know. It always kind of worked for us. Yeah. But the, the challenge from me to you is yeah. when I actually stepped away from Delight for a while. Yeah. We had a bunch of stuff go on and I just decided we had put a CEO in place, wanted him to succeed, but it wasn't perfect for me. So I started, started stepping it back and I would sit there. I was in Vancouver and I would sit there and I was like, how am I going to find another Ned? Yeah. Where do you, do you find these people when everybody else is working? Yeah. I'm the guy who's kind of trying to do something, but it's just like it's not natural. At business school, you kind of could find somebody, but like, how do we create those opportunities for people mm. to find that person to make it easy? Because it's so much easier to do it with another person. Mm. And it was a struggle. I was thinking, like, oh, I don't want to do this alone. It's so hard. I don't want to go through all that stuff again. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so let's go to that moment um, because I, I think it's easy for people to look at entrepreneurs like the entrepreneurs in this program, like yourself, and say. Oh, it doesn't sound that hard, but I could never do that. <laughs> you know, it's just like somehow you reach sixty-five million people, and you seem so calm about it. Like, when 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 was it hardest? And I'm guessing there's a moment here if you stepped out. Like, what what was going on with the company? Um, what caused that? When was it hard? I mean, honestly, it's yeah. it's like a, it's, it's a slog. <laughs> it really it's so hard. I mean, what Xavier was saying the other day. Our business, because I, I took two years to do a business with some folks in Vancouver, yeah. and like I've never done anything so easy in my life. <laughs> I mean, literally, you make kind of a good product. Like I would joke with them because I was like, we make kind of a good product. I go to this, I like take some flights to the states. I go talk to some CEOs of some solar companies, or whatever, <laughs> and then just like a pipe of dollars just like gushes <laughs> into your office, and you sit there and squander it. And then, like in our business, we like <laughs> make it sound easy. Yeah, <laughs> this was a, this was like a software startup yeah, that had right. a moderately good thing, yeah. and like but it wasn't. And then in our business, we like kill ourselves. Hundreds of people kill themselves going <laughs> in the middle of DRC every day, kill, 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 sweating for like fifty cents. Yeah. yeah, and you can add up as many fifty cents as you want, and it just like it's not that big an amount, and it's so, just so hard. And there's Taylor. I don't know. Yeah. It's really hard. So in the end, I find. For me, like, I need to take vacations, and uh, I needed to take a break, I think, from the business to get out of it for a little bit, and now we just need to, that's why I think it's all about people, too, like, yeah. you got to build the teams, you got to empower the people, you got to let them do what they want, otherwise, you just, everybody I know burns out in this, yeah. in social enterprise. Overseas, I don't know about here, yeah. but what I've seen overseas, because it's just, every, every time, even, like, recently, we were, like, kicking butt, and then a government policy changes. Yeah. Like, no matter what you do, somebody will do something that doesn't make any logical sense, totally inane, yeah. and can completely destroy your business. Yeah. And it's just constantly, always. Yeah. Yeah. As it gets bigger, does it get easier? Does it get harder? Does it get... Oh, for me, it's getting way easier when we get yeah. bigger. Yeah. Yeah. At yeah. the beginning, you just don't have any leeway. So anything happens, and then everybody skips the next 10 weekends and is working full out all the time because yeah. if you drop the ball, you're dead. And the hard part for me is just, as soon as you got big enough that you're like, 
these aren't just my like closest friends and we could all go back to some totally. job in the states but like yeah. and now we've got a bunch of people in countries who are dependent on us and and their family said don't do this totally. why would you bet on social enterprise and yeah. and we convinced them to come in yep now we have to deliver right yeah. Yeah. What, what, do you, what do you think has been so I get that you could have done some things better here along the ways but what what has been the key to this success and it could be a couple of things but I love like so much luck first of all <laughs> yeah. I mean I think like for us it's been like super hard work yeah. so much luck and then so many people who've supported us at every like from an idea at Stanford like the Stanford community rallied around us yeah. people made connections they shouldn't have made people supported us who shouldn't have supported us people joined who shouldn't have joined like we have so many people always supporting us yeah. I just cannot believe it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you think what do you think it was about D-Light in particular that garnered that? Well, I think like our industry, I, I often want to, if I'm talking to university yeah. students or other people, I say, our story, I think our story is a little different from some social enterprises because it's the perfect like win, 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 yeah. win, 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 win. Like you can make money, the need is so obvious, everybody wants it. It's like, you know, you turn a light on, people see it. The selling is also so much easier than all the other parts. Like, every part of our business makes sense and will happen. It's mm -hmm. a question of how fast can you do it. Like, can instead of it happening in 30 years, can we do it in six? Yeah. But it's happening. It's destined versus, you know, health or education or water. But, you know, people have to work way harder to find that spark and make it work because the yeah. customer pull isn't there in the same way. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the job creation angle to this, just so everybody here gets a sense of the scale, like, how, how many people are working for... Delay right now, making a, a livelihood through it. A livelihood through that probably thousand one hundred maybe yeah. total. Yeah. Um, but and Xavier will know this too. Like the in these businesses in Asia and Africa, we can like the like being a green entrepreneur can be as good a business as any for families. Yeah. And I think there'll be somewhere between in Africa alone ten and a hundred thousand jobs made in the next. 10 years yeah. in Asia, I'd say at, at, at least as much again. So like this is potentially a serious sector of the economy that yeah. can happen pretty fast. Yeah, totally. And maybe one last mm -hmm. question. Is, is this delight, like, is this, is this for life for you? Like, do you, are you, are you, do you ever see yourself leaving this company? What would it take? I wanted to, like, even when I was ramping my time down, it wasn't like a malicious thing or anything. I just, I, I always said, I don't want to be a, career CEO or anything yeah. like that. It was just like, what is the highest leverage thing that I can do for the world? Like, I'm not a pro manager or anything like that. Like, what's the single thing that I can do that adds the most value in the world? Yeah. But actually finding that when I got out, I was like, oh, that'd be cool, I'll go find that. But actually it's hard to find that yeah. thing I found. Right. And, so, and then it became really clear as D-Light was getting rocky, like D-Light's the single highest leverage thing I can do in the world. Yeah. But the day that's not true, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I have one last question. Sorry to ask so many, I, but right now, this current moment, what what do you what are you struggling with most? Uh, balance, being a dad, yeah. being a husband, yeah. and being there for my team. Mm. I live in Vancouver. We have no customers in Vancouver. <laughs> I have no teammates in Vancouver. <laughs> West Africa is not that far away. West Africa is not that far away. Asia. Neither is Asia. Yeah, neither is China. <laughs> but they're all in a different time zone and really far away. <laughs> I'm, I like I'm doing my best, but. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Oh man! Somebody somewhere is getting screwed always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and how, how do you? Because I think that's the reality of it, right? Like, how, how do you, how do you cope with that? Like, what's the, what's the mental hack that keeps you pushing through it all? Uh, you know, I think nothing. I guess I've come to like. There's nothing perfect in the world. Everybody just does what they can, what you can do best. I just talk to my wife about it constantly. You know, I talk to other people about it. Whenever I get a chance, I've picked everybody's brain who I've sat with pretty much on this topic. And I actually think it's going to be fine. Yeah. You know, like, we'll make a plan, execute on it. And if it gets too bad, then either I need to leave or we need to go to the market. So, like, yeah. it's that simple. Yeah. Cool, Sam. I could talk to you for hours. We're going to keep doing it. But thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you.